Hello and welcome to Bar 10 Test Prep, where it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. To that end, we upload content every day at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so you can be updated every time we upload new content. Let's get started. Question number one, the Federal Family Film Enhancement Act assesses an excise tax of 10% on the price of admission to public movie theaters when they show films that contain actual or simulated scenes of human sexual intercourse. Which of the following is the strongest argument against the constitutionality of this federal act? A. The act imposes a prior restraint on the freedom of speech protected by the First Amendment. B. The act is not rationally related to any legitimate national interest. C. The act violates the equal protection concepts embodied in the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment because it imposes a tax on the price of admission to view certain films and not on the price of admission to view comparable live performances. Or D, the act imposes a tax solely on the basis of the content of speech without adequate justification and therefore it is prohibited by the Freedom of Speech Clause of the First Amendment. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer now. If you chose option D, you'd be correct. The act imposes a tax solely on the basis of the content of speech without adequate justification, and therefore it is prohibited by the Freedom of Speech Clause of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. For content-based restrictions to be valid, the restrictions must be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling governmental interest. Strict scrutiny. The government, however, is permitted to use zoning ordinances to regulate location of adult bookstores and adult movie theaters because the government does have an important interest in preserving the character of its neighborhoods. Here, the Federal Family Film Enhancement Act assesses an excise tax of 10% on the price of admission to public movie theaters when they show films that contain actual or simulated scenes of human sexual intercourse. This is a content-based restriction. So, for example, the 10% excise tax is assessed based on the content of the film shown. As such, this restriction must meet the strict scrutiny that we described previously. It must be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest. Therefore, the strongest argument against the constitutionality of this federal act is that the act imposes a tax solely on the basis of the content of speech without adequate justification, and therefore it is prohibitive by the Freedom of Speech Clause of the First Amendment. Question number two. At Darrow's trial for stealing an automobile, Darrow called the character witness, Good, who testified that Darrow had an excellent reputation for honesty. In rebuttal, the prosecutor calls Wick to testify that he recently saw Darrow cheat on a college examination. The evidence should be A. Admitted because Darrow has opened the door to the prosecutor's proof of bad character evidence. B. Admitted because the cheating involves dishonesty or false statement. C. Excluded because it has no probative value on any issue in the case. Or D. Excluded because Darrow's cheating can be inquired into only on cross-examination of good. Take 10 seconds and choose what you think is the best answer now. If you chose answer D, excluded because Darrow's cheating can be inquired into only on cross-examination of good, you'd be correct. Under the federal rules of evidence, the credibility of a witness may be attacked by any party, including the party calling him. Acts of misconduct by a witness that did not result in a conviction are admissible to impeach in both civil and criminal cases if those acts involve dishonesty. Impeachment by this method is only allowed on cross-examination of the witness, not through extrinsic evidence. In this case, Darrow is on trial for stealing an automobile, which is a crime involving the character trait of honesty. The defense called Good to testify that Darrow had an excellent reputation for honesty, and the prosecution can offer pertinent character evidence to rebut. The prosecutor can do so by cross-examining Good and asking about a specific act of Darrow's misconduct, such as Darrow cheating on a college examination. However, the prosecutor may not call Wick to testify, 
that he saw Darrow cheat because extrinsic evidence is inadmissible for impeachment by non-conviction misconduct that bears on truthfulness. Therefore, Wick's testimony should be excluded because Darrow's cheating can be inquired into only on cross-examination. Question number three. Doe, the governor of state, signed a death warrant for Rend, a convicted murderer. Abel and Baker are active opponents of the death penalty. At a demonstration protesting the execution of Rend, Abel and Baker carried large signs that stated, Governor Doe, murderer. Television station XYZ broadcast news coverage of the demonstration, including pictures of the signs carried by Abel and Baker. If Governor Doe asserts a defamation claim against XYZ, will Doe prevail? A. Yes, because the signs would cause persons to hold Doe in lower esteem. B. Yes, if Doe proves that XYZ showed the signs with knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard of the truth that Doe had not committed homicide. C. No, unless Doe proves he suffered pecuniary loss resulting from harm to his reputation proximately caused by the defendant's signs. Or D. No, if the only reasonable interpretation of the signs was that the term murderer was intended as a characterization of one who would sign a death warrant. Take 10 seconds. If you chose option D, no, if the only reasonable interpretation of the signs was that the term murderer was intended as a characterization of one who would sign a death warrant, then you'd be correct. The Supreme Court has held that whether a remark is defamatory must be determined under the circumstances the remark was in fact made. Here, television station XYZ broadcast news coverage of a demonstration, including pictures of signs carried by Abel and Baker. Their signs stated, Governor Doe, murderer. A reasonable viewer of the broadcast would not conclude these signs were alleging Governor Doe was guilty of a criminal offense and in fact himself was a murderer. The broadcast was covered as part of a demonstration and in that context it was obvious these signs were intended as a critique of Governor Doe's death penalty policy. Therefore, Governor Doe will not prevail on a defamation claim against XYZ if the only reasonable interpretation of the signs was that the term murderer was intended as a characterization of one who would sign a death warrant. Question number four. Pitt sued Dill for damages for back injuries received in a car wreck. Dill disputed the damages and sought to prove that Pitt's disability, of any, resulted from a childhood horseback riding accident. Pitt admitted the childhood accident, but contended it had no lasting effects. Pitt calls Dr. Webb, an orthopedist who had never examined Pitt, and poses to Webb a hypothetical question as to the cause of the disability that omits any reference to the horseback riding accident. The question was not provided to opposing counsel before the trial. The best ground for objecting to this question would be that A. Webb lacked first-hand knowledge concerning Pitt's condition. B. The hypothetical question omitted a clearly significant fact. C. Hypothetical questions are no longer permitted. Or D. Sufficient notice of the hypothetical question was not given to the opposing counsel before the trial. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer now. If you chose option B, the hypothetical question omitted a clearly significant fact, you'd be correct. To be admissible, expert testimony must be based on the knowledge, experience, and training of the expert. Be beyond the normal experience of an average lay juror. Be helpful to the determination of the action based on proven and reliable data and methods. And be an application of such methods and data to the underlying facts of the case at hand. Hypothetical questions are, in fact, actually permitted. In this case, Pitt sued Dill for damages for back injuries received in a car wreck. Dill disputed these damages and sought to prove the Pitt's disability, if any, resulted from a childhood horseback riding accident. Pitt calls Dr. Webb to testify as an expert and poses a hypothetical question, which, remember, is completely allowed to him as to the cause of the disability that omitted any reference to the horseback riding accident. This hypothetical is misleading because it omits any reference to the possible alternative cause of Pitt's disability, which is the main issue in the case, in fact. As such, the best ground for objecting to this question would be that the hypothetical question omitted a clearly significant fact. 
Let's move on to question number five. Doe, the governor of state, signed a death warrant for Rend, a convicted murderer. Abel and Baker are active opponents of the death penalty. At a demonstration protesting the execution of Rend, Abel and Baker carried large signs that stated, Governor Doe, murderer. Television station XYZ broadcast news coverage of that demonstration, including pictures of the signs carried by Abel and Baker. If Doe asserts against XYZ a claim for damages for intentional infliction of emotional distress, will Doe prevail? A. Yes, if the broadcast showing the signs cause Doe to suffer severe emotional distress. B. Yes, because the assertion on the signs was extreme and outrageous. C. No, unless Doe suffered physical harm as a consequence of the emotional distress caused by the signs. And finally, D. No, because XYZ did not publish a false statement of fact with actual malice. Take 10 seconds and choose what you think is the best answer now. If you chose answer D, no, because XYZ did not publish a false statement of fact with actual malice, you'd be correct. Remember, the intentional infliction of emotional distress requires A, intentional or reckless infliction, B, a severe emotional or mental distress, C, by extreme and outrageous conduct, D, actual damages, and E, causation. Conduct is extreme and outrageous if it would cause an average member of the community to immediately react in outrage. Here, process of elimination is the fastest way to solve this question because we know the elements for IIED. The key missing in the facts presented... Oh, God, this is a... No Question number six. Sally told Michael she would like to have sexual intercourse with him and that he should come to her apartment that night at 7 p.m. After Michael arrived, he and Sally went into the bedroom. As Michael started to remove Sally's blouse, Sally said she had changed her mind. Michael tried to convince her to have intercourse with him. But after 10 minutes of her sustained refusals, Michael left the apartment. Unknown to Michael, Sally was 15 years old. Because she appeared to be older, Michael believed her to be about 18 years old. A statute in the jurisdiction provides a person commits rape in the second degree if he has sexual intercourse with a girl, not his wife, who is under the age of 16 years. If Michael is charged with attempting to violate this statute, he is A. Guilty, because no mental state is required as to the element of age. B. Guilty because he persisted after she told him she had changed her mind. C. Not guilty because he reasonably believed she had consented and voluntarily withdrew after she told him she had changed her mind. Or D. Not guilty because he did not intend to have intercourse with a girl under the age of 16. Take 10 seconds. If you chose option D, not guilty, because he did not intend to have intercourse with a girl under the age of 16, you'd be correct. In order to prove attempt, the state must show that, one, the defendant intended to commit the crime, and that, two, the defendant took a substantial step towards completing that crime. Regardless of the underlying crime, attempt is always a specific intent crime. So here, it's irrelevant that this is a strict liability claim. In this case, Michael believed Sally to be about 18 years old. As such, Michael did not have the specific intent to commit rape in the second degree. For example, he did not intend to have intercourse with a girl under the age of 16. As such, if Michael is charged with attempting to violate the statute, he should properly be found not guilty. Question number seven. Under a written agreement, Super Pastries, Inc. promised to sell its entire output of baked buns at a specific unit price to Bonnie Buns, Incorporated, a retailer, for one year. Bonnie Buns promised not to sell any other supplier's baked buns. For this question only, assume the following facts. Shortly after making the contract and before Super Pastries had tendered any buns, Bonnie's Buns decided that the contract had become undesirable because of a sudden sharp decline in its customers' demand for baked buns. It renounced the agreement. And Super Pastries now sues for breach of contract. Which of the following will the court probably decide? A. 
Bonnie's Buns wins because mutuality of obligation was lacking and that Bonnie's Buns made no express promise to buy any of Super Pastry's baked goods. B. Bonnie's Buns wins because the agreement was void for indefiniteness of quantity and price for the year involved. C. Super Pastries wins because Bonnie's Buns promised to sell at retail Super Pastries baked buns exclusively if it sold any such buns at all and applied a promise to use its best efforts to sell Super Pastries one-year output of baked buns. Or D. Super Pastries wins because under the applicable law, both parties to a sale of goods contract impliedly assume the risk of price and demand fluctuations. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer now. If you chose option C, you'd be correct. Super Pastries wins because Bonnie's Buns promised to sell at retail Super Pastries baked buns exclusively if it sold any such buns at all and applied a promise to use its best efforts to sell Super Pastries one-year output of baked buns. A requirement contract states the quantity of goods to be delivered under the contract in terms of the buyer's requirements, seller's output, or in terms of exclusivity. Consideration is found from the fact that the buyer is required to meet all its requirements from seller, despite the fact that the contract itself does not expressly require the buyer to buy any fixed quantity of goods. While a requirements contract will not fail for lack of consideration if the buyer in good faith has no real requirement and therefore orders none of, on that basis, it will fail if the buyer has no real obligation to buy goods it needs and can accept or reject without regard to its actual requirements for the goods. In this case, Super Pastries Inc. promised to sell its entire output of baked buns to Bonnie's Buns Inc. for one year and Bonnie's Buns promised not to sell any other supplier's baked buns. This is a valid output contract, so if the Super Pastries sues Bonnie's Buns for breach of contract, Super Pastries will win because an output contract implies a good faith effort to sell the items being purchased. Question number eight, insurance is provided in the state of Shoshone only by private companies. Although the state insurance commissioner inspects insurance companies for solvency, the state does not regulate their rates or their policies. An insurance company charges higher rates for burglar insurance to residents of one part of a county in Shoshone than to residents of another section of that same county because of the different crime rates in those areas. Foster is a resident of that county who was charged a higher rate by the insurance company because of the location of her residence. Foster sues the insurance company, alleging that the differential in insurance rates unconstitutionally denies her the equal protection of laws. Will Foster's suit succeed? A. Yes, because the higher crime rate in Foster's neighborhood demonstrates that the county police are not giving persons who reside there the equal protection of the laws. B. Yes, because the insurance rate differential is inherently discriminatory. C. No, because the constitutional guarantee of equal protection of the laws is not applicable to the actions of these insurance companies. Or D. No, because there is a rational basis for the differential in insurance rates. Take 10 seconds. Choose the best answer now. If you chose option C, you're doing well. No, because the constitutional guarantee of equal protection of the laws is not applicable to the actions of these insurance companies. Equal protection is invoked when a law treats one person or class of persons differently from others. Equal protection provides that all citizens must be offered the equal protection of the laws. The Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment applies equal protection to the states. The 14th Amendment does not apply to private actors unless the public function exception or the entanglement exception applies. In this case, a private insurance company is the actor conducting discriminatory pricing for burglary insurance, which is based on the different crime rates in these distinct areas. Shoshone does not regulate the rates of policies of private insurance companies. The 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause would only apply to Shoshone's actions, not the private insurance company's actions. Thus, Foster's suit will not succeed. 
Let's look at the three other options we have here. A, yes, because the higher crime rate in Foster's neighborhood demonstrates that the county police are not giving persons who reside there the equal protection of the laws. This is beyond irrelevant. It is addressing an issue with the police as opposed to the state and the insurance company and the control of the pricing of the policies therein. So A can be eliminated immediately. B, yes, because the insurance rate deferential is inherently discriminatory. If we're analyzing option B, then we're clear by the facts of the of the specific pattern here that uh, this is a constitutional claim. So as a result, it must be bought as a constant a violation of constitutional rights. That being said, we're relatively clear that the 14th Amendment does not apply to private actors. So as a result, B could not be a possible answer. D. No, because there is a rational basis for the differential in insurance rates. Please remember that the rational basis distinction is only applicable, again, to state actors in defining a law. Here, the 14th Amendment would simply not be applicable, given the fact that we have a non-state actor or a private company as the actor. As a result, after an analysis, only option C would be potentially applicable, and all three other options would simply not apply. Question number nine. Daggett was prosecuted for murder of Vales, whose body was found one morning in the street near Daggett's house. The state calls Witt, a neighbor, to testify that during the night before the body was found, he heard Daggett's wife scream, You killed him. You killed him. Witt's testimony is A. Admissible as a report of a statement of belief. B. Admissible as a report of an excited utterance. C. Inadmissible because it reports a privileged spousal communication or D, inadmissible on spousal immunity grounds, but only if the wife objects. Take 10 seconds. If you chose option B, admissible as a report of an excited utterance, you'd be correct. Hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement. A hearsay statement related to a startling event or condition is admissible if made when the declarant was still under the stress and excitement. Emotional state of the speaker is the key to this exception. Timing is irrelevant. In this case, the wife's out-of-court statement is being offered through Witt's testimony to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement, i.e., for example, that Daggett killed Vales. This hearsay statement was made during the night before Vales' body was found. Daggett's wife screamed twice, you killed him, you killed him. It seems that Daggett's wife either witnessed the murder or saw Vales' dead body, either of which is clearly a startling event. The exclamation mark coupled with the description of her screaming the statement twice shows that she was under the stress of excitement. Accordingly, Witt's testimony is admissible as a report of an excited utterance. Let's look at the three other options and analyze those as to why they could not be correct. Option A, admissible as a report of a statement of belief that is not an existing exception or exemption, so as a result, we can eliminate that straight away. C, inadmissible because it reports a privileged spousal communication. The issue here is relatively straightforward if you analyze the fact pattern. The spousal privilege does not extend to other individuals that hear the spouse's comments. So, for example, here you have a husband who allegedly committed a crime, a wife who then speaks out, out loud a statement, and a third-party individual that is not a part of that relationship that hears that statement. The spousal privilege is limited to within the marriage. The spousal privilege does not extend to other individuals that would hear such a statement. As a result, the rules of hearsay would apply because, in fact, the witness was not the direct commentator nor the individual that made the comment directly, but instead an individual that heard the comment. As a result, we would look to see if any of the exemptions or exceptions of hearsay were applicable. Finally, D, inadmissible on spousal immunity grounds, but only if the wife objects. Same analysis here. 
the person who actually, in fact, heard the statement and is now testifying is an individual outside of the marriage. So as a result, the spousal immunity grounds would, in fact, be irrelevant. C and D can be eliminated straight away, as can A. As a result, B would be the only option left with a bio, as a viable answer. Question number 10, the last one in this grouping. One evening, Parnell had several drinks and then started to drive home. As he was proceeding down Main Boulevard, an automobile pulled out of a side street to his right. Parnell's car struck this automobile broadside. The driver of the other car was killed as a result of the collision. A breath analysis test administered after the accident showed that Parnell satisfied the legal definition of intoxication. If Parnell is prosecuted for manslaughter, his best chance for acquittal would be based on an argument that A. The other driver was contributorily negligent. B. The collision would have occurred even if Parnell had not been intoxicated. C. Because of his intoxication, he lacked the mens rea needed for manslaughter. Or D. Driving while intoxicated requires no mens rea and so cannot be the basis for misdemeanor manslaughter. Take 10 seconds and choose the best answer now. If you chose option B, the collision would have occurred even if Parnell had not been intoxicated, you'd be correct. Please remember the four elements of a crime consist of a guilty act, a guilty mind, concurrence, and causation. In this case, Parnell had several drinks and then started to drive home. As he was proceeding down Main Boulevard, an automobile pulled out of a side street and Parnell broadsided this vehicle, killing the other driver. We have a guilty act there. Parnell was in fact driving. We have a guilty mind, i.e. depraved heart or criminal negligence from driving while intoxicated. This, in essence, is a presumption. And we have concurrence, i.e. the guilty act and the guilty mind occurred, in essence, concurrently. So the issue that remains is causation. Therefore, if Parnell is prosecuted for manslaughter, his best chance for an acquittal would be based on an argument that the collision would have occurred even if Parnell had not been intoxicated. As always, thank you for joining us on Bar 10 Test Prep, where it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. To that end, we upload content every day at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you can be updated every time we do upload that new content for you.